Everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, how many of you are familiar with the names the Hatfields and the McCoys? Have you ever heard of them before? Yeah, I, I confess I didn't know a lot about them uh, until a couple years ago when the History Channel uh, came out with that mini-series about the families. I'm kind of a history nerd. I like, like that stuff. Uh, for, for a little over a decade, uh, those two families fought along the West Virginia-Kentucky border up in the hills. And, and they had a blood feud. And by the time it was all done, by the time the dust had settled, there were 15 people in those families that were dead. Uh, another nine that were incarcerated. And you think, my goodness, what, what could happen? What, what feud? How, how could this have started that, that these people would fight so harshly where 15 people would lose their lives and another nine would spend their lives in, in prison. And it, it actually started in 1878 when the two patriarchs of those families, Randall McCoy and Devil Ann's Hatfield, fought over the ownership of a pig. A pig. One pig. Uh, they, they disputed over that, and, and they thought that was important enough that it escalated to the point that they killed 15 of one another. And like I said, another nine went to jail. I like bacon too. But that's, that's pretty extreme, don't you think? Um, their, their names have become synonymous with enemies, with, with rivalries, with, with feuds and hatred. Uh, but that's not the only example of of enemies in our culture, rivalries and, and deep animosities where people pick a camp. Uh, I, I don't know if you are aware of this. Uh, we have an election next month. Did you know that? How, how could you not, right? You go into certain parts of this country and you say a word like Democrat or Republican and... and People are going to have some strong feelings about that, aren't they? You talk about Hillary or the Donald, <laughs> and people may not like you depending on which side you're on. Uh, it's not just politics. Sports are this way. I love sports. Anybody like sports? Uh, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. <laughs> well, that was rude. You aren't very good guests. And, and, and as a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, maybe the only thing that makes me as happy as seeing the Steelers win is seeing the Baltimore Ravens lose. Uh, that is their biggest rival. I hate that team. I, I have a buddy that is a big college football fan, and he, he likes Michigan, and he hates, he hates Ohio State. In basketball, there's, there's North Carolina and Duke. Uh, I grew up in central Illinois. Uh, anybody here from Illinois? Uh, I grew up in Peoria. And, and we were kind of right in the middle of Chicago and St. Louis. And that line between the Cubs and the Cardinals was pretty, pretty deep. Uh, maybe for some of you here in Missouri, it was the line between the Royals and the, the Cardinals. Although I got to say, you Kansas City fans were pretty quiet until just a few years ago. Um, it's true it's true rivalries run deep we, we almost like cheering against our enemies as much as we like rooting for our own side uh, if any of you are literature fans uh, uh, when, when I was in high school I was forced to read Romeo and Juliet was anybody else forced to read that uh, Shakespeare had his own version of the Hatfields and the McCoys, didn't he? With the Capulets and the Montagues, they hated each other. Let me add one more pair of enemies to the list. This one might make you a little uncomfortable. Makes me a little uncomfortable. On one side, you have humans. On the other side, you have God. Wait, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. God is love, 
right? God is, God is love. He, he loves us. He's good. There's no way He would see us as an enemy. Well, it was in the scripture we had read tonight. I don't know if you caught it. Um, calls us His enemies. And that's kind of hard for me to get my mind around. I don't like to think of myself as an enemy of the Almighty. How about you? But the Bible tells me I, I have been. I have some good news to go along with some bad news tonight. Which one would you like to hear first? Oh, you all are just like me. Somebody comes up to you and says, I got some good news and I got some bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? Does anybody pick the good news first? Okay, you guys are weird. You got it. The good news can wait. Bad news, you got to get that over with, don't you? Let's just get it over with. Let's, let's find out what it is and I can deal with it. Plus, you get to end on a high note, right? That's, that's my thinking. A lot of you are smart. I can see you nodding. If you're agreeing with me, that makes you smart. Um, so I'm going to follow that tonight as I talk about good news and bad news. And, and the good news and the bad news concerns Jesus and the cross. Well, what's the bad news about Jesus and the cross? What on earth could be bad about that? Well, let's look at Romans here for a second. Romans chapter 5. It was read for you earlier. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. That word therefore is always kind of a big one in the Bible. It takes you back to what comes before it. For the first three chapters of Romans, Paul's laying out the case um, that, that whether you're Gentile or Jew, uh, you, you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, this is a church that is divided along ethnic lines, Gentiles and Jews. Um, and um, when we see people fight today, we tend to take an approach that says, hey, you're, you're both pretty, right? You're all good. Let's all get along. Paul kind of goes the other way. He says, you all stink. <laughs> you, you've all sinned. All, every last one of you has blown it, so stop it. And then in chapter 4, he says, uh, you're justified through your faith in Jesus, not by being good, because as we've established in the first three chapters, you all stink. And, and so now that we have this ability to be justified before God because we believe in Jesus Christ, it says in verse 1, we have peace with God. We have pe peace. I wasn't aware I was at war. For you, we, we have peace with God. If you, if you go further down into verse uh, 10, it says, if when we were God's what? Enemies. Enemies. That's not my word. That, that's not my word. If when we were God's enemies. Why? Well, that doesn't sound good. We were God's enemies? It gets a little worse. Go up a verse in verse 9. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from what? God's wrath. When's the last time you went home and said, boy, I really love that sermon I heard today. Oh, really? What was it about? God's wrath. It's real inspiring. God's wrath. There's, there's some, some rough stuff in this passage. You, you kind of get the bad news that comes with the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in the first century, the cross was not a piece of jewelry that people wore that made them feel warm and fuzzy. It was an instrument of death. And what does the cross of Jesus Christ communicate to us that isn't good? Well, that I... It was God's enemy. That I was under his wrath. Why? Because we all stink. Because we've all sinned. And, and, and the cross is a slap in my face, screaming at me, You're not that good. Do, do you know anybody that's banking their hope 
in this world and in the next life on their own goodness. Well, I, I, I'm a good person. I mean, the good kind of outweighs the bad. Sure, I've done a thing or two, but I'm basically a good person. That's not what we read here in Romans. The cross does not allow us to think such things. We are God's enemies because we've broken his rules. Sin is a problem. It's a serious problem. Lest we try to poo-poo it or rationalize it away or sweep it under the rug or act like it's not a big deal. It wasn't that big. The cross shouts at us that it was. Sin is a serious problem. Sin will be punished. Sin will be punished. I think sometimes as, as Christians, we get this mistaken belief that God is some sort of magician, that, that I come to Him and I ask Him for forgiveness, and poof, He makes my sins disappear. That's not quite how it works. No, sin will be punished. And your choice is either He can punish you, or you can accept the punishment that was dished out on His Son. The cross reminds us that God went to great lengths to spare us from his wrath when he took it upon himself. Sin is serious. It will be punished. Man, I'm not that good. I don't like to think about that. But the cross doesn't give me any choice. It doesn't give me any choice. It is a reminder to me that I am the reason, that you are the reason that Jesus had to come and do what he did. That's not the warmest, fuzziest thing I've ever heard. How about you? Yeah, Jesus had to die. Guess what? It's your fault. But like I said, there's, there's good news here. There's good news here, too, in this passage. You get the bad news and the good news. I want you to look in verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, the first piece of good and this is really important good news that we have to get out of the way and address first. We learn in this passage what the cross tells us is that God loves us. God loves us. Why, why would he do that? Why would he make himself an object of wrath on your behalf? Because he loves you. And, and it talks about the kind of nobility we see in our culture. Someone who would lay down their life for someone else. We, we lay down our lives for people we love on our lives for people we know, we care about. And, and, and especially, uh, he says, you know, you might do that if they're good. But Jesus takes his love a step further than that because he sees us in our sinful condition. He sees all the bad news about us. Yeah, okay, I'll die for them. He loves us. Sometimes I think we get the mistaken idea that we got to clean up our act before we come to Jesus. You know, I'll start coming to church again when, when I get my, my things together a little bit better. Or, or I'll think about getting baptized when, when I've just fixed some stuff and I feel like I've earned it a little better. Hey, good luck. It just doesn't work that way. What makes Jesus so unique, what makes Christianity so unique is Jesus does not say to you, get your act together and then come and follow me. He says, come follow me. Let me help you get your act together. It's not do this and I'll love you. It's I love you. Now go do this. And that's different. And, and, and the cross tells us that because we had not done anything to respond to him. And he did that. We were enemies because of us. And he did this to, to change that. Second piece of good news that we see in this text, besides the fact that he loves us. Uh, number two is he makes us clean. He makes us clean. Um, verse one, again, we have been justified. 
through faith. Verse 9, we have that same word. We have now been justified by his blood. Justified is a, is a legal term. It's a court term. You stand before God clean. A show of hands. I don't, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, how many of you ever done something you regret? Oh, you sinners. You ever, you ever wish you could just go back and do something different? I mean, just wish you could go back and change something? Well, you can't. But what you can do is have Christ take it away from you and make you clean. Jesus is such an idealist, if you read him in Scripture. He, he has such high standards for his people. Now, he's not naive. I mean, he understands humanity, but he is an idealist. He teaches the best. And he says these crazy things, like in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 48, be perfect. As your Father in heaven is perfect. And sometimes people try to downplay that word and say, well, it really means complete or whole. Um, yeah, except he qualifies it and says, be like the Father. That's pretty perfect. So, so if be perfect sounds too impossible, just go be like God the Father. That, that okay? He gives us these impossible goals. But they're not impossible when he's with us. Because that's what he does. He takes our sin away and makes us clean. There's a really cool verse in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, it's actually given in the context of husbands and wives. As, as Paul tells husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But as he explains Christ's love for the church, listen to what it says Christ does for us. It says, He gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I don't know about you, I, I have felt a lot of different ways in my walk with Christ. But uh, let me tell you some words I would not use to describe myself. Holy, clean, radiant, stainless, wrinkleless. That might not even be a word, so I probably wouldn't use that. Blemishless. That's not how I feel about myself. How about you? But do you accept what God says or not? Because this is what it says Jesus died to make you. Spotless. Clean. Holy. Not a single blemish. That's pretty good news. He doesn't just love you. He makes you clean. Why? Well, that's for our last little piece of good news here. He makes you clean because he wants to restore the relationship that was lost back in the Garden of Eden. That's why he does it. Because he wants you to be with him. He wants you to be with him. So he's going to make you like him. Listen to this language from Romans 5. Verse 2, it says, through Jesus, through whom, referring to Jesus, we have gained access by faith. We have gained access. In verse 10 and 11, it says, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we have received Reconciliation. Justification is a legal term. It's a court term. Reconciliation is a relational term. We, we've made up. We've, we've made up. That's why he makes you clean. Because he wants to be with you. We lost that in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve got to talk to him. They walked with him, I mean, face to face, and we lost him. 
And the whole rest of the story of this book are the links that God went to to get that back, culminating in the cross of Jesus Christ, where He showed His love for us. He cleansed us and restored the relationship. That's pretty good news. So what do we do with that? What do we do with the bad news and the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ? Well, number one, I I would tell you, don't ignore the bad news. Sometimes we kind of dust over and gloss over the bad so we can hurry up and get to the good. But I want you to hear this tonight. You cannot understand how good God is until you come to grips with how good you are not. Until you come to grips with how good you are not, you cannot fully appreciate just how good God is. Don't forget the bad news. Don't gloss over that. If there is something in your life that has caused a rift in the relationship between you and your Lord, the best thing, the most godly thing you can do is find someone and admit it. Confession is so good for the soul. And and if you're battling with something, if you're struggling with some sin that has put a wedge between you and God, you need to bring that puppy out to the light. Get it out to the darkness. If you need to come up and talk to me, if you want to talk to Andy or Shandy or one of the leaders, some, some pal of yours in the audience that you trust, do not keep it to yourself. Fighting that battle all by your lonesome and saving your reputation in public has not worked. Put aside your pride and get it out. Take the power away from that sin and give it to Jesus. Sometimes, in order to make peace with God, we have to make peace with ourselves. And we can't do that when we hide. Another place that I could go, kind of thought of this when I read verse 3 when it talks about rejoicing in our sufferings. I thought it's kind of ironic. The more we make peace with God, the more we seem to be at odds with the world. You can't really be friends with both. There are Christians all over the world today who would shout that testimony through a microphone to, or a microphone to us as they lay down their life in the face of oppression, torture, because they decide that dying with Jesus is much better than the alternative of living without Him. And we don't pay that price here. But it is kind of sad. Kind of a sad commentary on the world and on Christianity that those Christians who often enjoy the most freedom to speak up for their faith are often the most quiet. Maybe in a, a, a school, I don't know, that, you know, maybe you know somebody that goes to a school that um, has a lot to do with, like, science and stuff. Maybe, maybe just, I, I mean, I'm just imagining maybe there's some folks in a place like that that might think um, you're not quite as intelligent if you believe stuff like this. Hmm. You okay with that? Do you want to make peace with them or you want to make peace with God? Are you okay with whatever price you might have to pay to follow Jesus? Because sometimes when we make peace with our Creator, some of the rest of the creation might not be too pleased with that. And finally, the other last place I'll go with this. Don't forget the good news. When you admit that sin, when you acknowledge what you do wrong, don't forget that God loves sinners. Her name was Karen. She came into my office. She's crying. It was her umpteenth bad decision with men. And she, in her mind, had ruined her life yet again. And before we could talk about any fix, 
before we could talk about doing anything differently, there was a question that she needed to know the answer to. With tears in her eyes, she asked me, have I gone too far? Have I done too much? Is God through with me? I don't know if you've ever felt like that. Because you felt so bad and so guilty about something you did wrong. But the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ is that I am reminded of the links that my Savior went to for me and for her that I can look her in the eye and say no. You're pretty good at sinning, but you're not that good. The cross is bigger than what you've done. I hope every one of you knows that tonight. The cross is bigger than what you've done. You can't ignore the bad news. We can't gloss over that. But don't you dare. Don't you dare talk about Jesus and leave out the good news. He loves you. He wants to make you clean. And he wants to restore that friendship that he used to enjoy back in the days of Eden. The cross. The bad news is, it reminds me how bad I am. How bad you are. But the good news is it also reminds me just how good God is.